uh, let me introduce the first uh, session and the first speaker of the day, um, Alan Richardson. Alan is going to be talking about automating uh, to augment testing. Alan is, is, is a famous name in the world of testing. Uh, he's a software testing consultant who also goes by the name of Evil Tester. He consults coaches and mentors teams to help them test better, automate, and deliver software with improved quality. Um, Alan advocates uh, evil testing, in quotes, a special blend of skill, attitude, and pragmatism to help software development teams test and develop better. He's, excuse me, he's authored multiple books, conducted training sessions, and spoken at several conferences. We're very happy and proud to have Alan kick off day four at Breakpoint. Over to you, Alan. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, let me share the screen, see if we can get this working properly, because by share screen, I mean share window because you don't want to see the whole screen. Okay, so since it's gone away, I'm assuming that I'm sharing. All right, hello. Um, yep, so my name is, so good, thank you. So my name is Alan Richardson. You can find me online at a bunch of different places. So Twitter, at EvoTester, EvoTester.com. And I've got a load of code on GitHub, on github.com slash EvoTester. And a lot of it is uh, stuff automating other things and some of it is actual applications and what i want to do in this talk is look at some examples of automating that i've done over the years um with some kind of sample case studies of things that are like what i've done in production and things that i've done to test applications that i've been working on which is all to augment testing the test strategy and approach that i'm putting in place because i just want to continually remind people that we automate in order to help us test better and i want to remind us that all the rules that we are told about automating are not actually rules they're guidelines so i'm going to show you some examples of when i kind of slightly edged away from those guidelines so test automation what is just test automation in general? Basically, what we're talking about is automating the paths through a system. And when we automate the execution of those paths, we assert on conditions to make the execution stop when things are not the way we want. And we kind of report on that. So that's a high level model of automated execution. And the reason for telling you this, I know you know this, is uh, just to try and create some models in our head because i want multiple models so that's one model of what we do but i want you to bear in mind that um test automation is just a subset in general of automating right because we use lots of tools as we're testing that's automating different parts of our process we automate the build process and um, that's a part of automation we automate the release process so deploying applications that have been built and run the unit tests onto test environments, onto production. We automate monitoring when it's in live. We do model-based automating, multiple paths, property-based testing, random data, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. And very often when we think of test automation, we're thinking of the strategic stuff that works within the build process. But we also do a lot of automating as tactical activities just to automate stuff. Um, knocking up quick sets of test data, checking if something is working, um, loading data over here, pushing something in, because we automate processes, the doing things that we do in our, our job. So then when we start thinking, well, what can we actually automate? Let's have a different model. We can automate interacting with something, manipulating something, observing something, seeing something change on a screen, interrogation going into the database and checking some data. We can automate the condition checking of things. Then we can automate asserting on it. We can automate reporting. Uh, what else? We could automate test data, which might be a form of reporting because we're generating stuff. There's a whole bunch of things that we can automate, which again is a model slightly bigger than test automation. Because what I really want to encourage everyone to do is to think differently. And by that, I mean, think constantly keep reevaluating what you're doing um, and look at the the work that you're doing what processes do you actually do when you test would it help to automate some of that could you automate some of that do you have the skill sets are your skill sets preventing you from automating things that could help looking at the stuff that you're not doing 
the stuff that you don't have time for? And could you do that if you had tooling or automating? And I also want to stick in your head the notion of reuse. Reusing what you've got in ways that you didn't anticipate when you created it. Very often we create frameworks that can help us, but they prevent reuse. So keep in mind that if we built things more flexibly, we could reuse them to help us in ways we don't anticipate. So simple examples, what if we could have environments that just spin up automatically? Like plenty of people do that. What if the browser could be in the right place so that you can just start exploring? It can do a whole bunch of preset work, bring up the browser, and then you can start. What if you could test while a bunch of other people were using the same data at the same time quite easily? So you didn't have to organize your team to all test at the same time so that you could check uh, whether there's any multi-user issues. Because what we want to do is use automated tools, scripts to expand the options that are open to us. Um, what if we had something that could monitor the work that we're doing, observe in the background and tell us if there's issues, because it can be really hard to observe all the things that are going on. So tooling could help us. Um, what if we could, <laughs> a lot of people don't like having long running automated in the background. But if we did, then maybe it could just randomly do a whole bunch of stuff and tell us if there's problems, right? All of these what if all these things that we could be doing that we're not and it doesn't all have to be um new scripts it could be reusing tools i use a lot of uh, proxy tools when i'm doing exploratory testing and they have fuzzers because they're very often security testing tools so i can take messages that are being sent and i can fuzz them and i can use that to create test data very quickly and um, we can use the release scripts that we go into production to create test environments. There's no point in having different scripts for different things. Trying to use them early will help. We could slow down the performance tests to use as background load. And I'm gonna show you an example or explain an example later of doing something outside the realm of performance testing. We could um, use the automated execution that we already have to check the release. We could be monitoring to look for uh, weak signals, things that are not problems yet, but might be monitoring the memory use, monitoring the um, speed of requests that are going through to help us see whether there's going to be problems. Now, first example I'm going to give you is uh, an example from a project when we were testing it live. It was a registration process. It was spanned across six different pages. There was 30, 40, 50 fields, can't remember. Um, and it wasn't a complicated thing, but it had a lot of validation rules in there. But it wasn't viewed as strategic for our project, so it had been outsourced, which meant that we had no time to test it because it wasn't going to need testing because it was going to work. Um, we didn't need to automate it because it was going to work. Problem is, Every time we got a release, something different wasn't working. But it would very often take us days to find that problem because it was all related to what combination, what page we were on. And it was hard to find. And we had very much a throw over the wall process. Now, we know common test automation knowledge, the rules that we work with, are never automate an application that has lots of bugs. Just don't do it because it'll be flaky and it's hard and never automate something that is changing. Wait until the application is stable. This is common knowledge. This is what we do. The problem is if we do that in an environment where we're getting releases all the time and it has a lot of problems, then we spend a lot of people time um, finding the issue. Uh, and with an unstable application, that's really frustrating and, it's, and we don't make any progress. So going meta again, thinking about what do we really do this for? We automate uh, to save time. Some of us automate to say, try and save money. We automate to increase the coverage of the testing we do. We automate to allow people to do other things that are more valuable. So in this example, how could I do that? So what we did, or what we could do, is look at the common issues that we're finding, seeing if there's anything in common with them. Look at the paths that they follow along because all execution is, is based on paths. We'd look at the data partitions that they've got. 
and then just try and exhaustively hit that. So rather than writing lots of tests, write a couple of tests that have a lot of data and a lot of variation to try and trigger these problems. And this is a form of model-based testing. And when I say model-based testing, I don't mean model-based tooling. I don't mean you have to go out and find a model-based test tool. I mean, you just have to create models in code that are explored by the code and very often that just means random data. So if I model the equivalence partition data and it's all valid data, it should all work. Um, and that's in terms of the paths. If I follow this path, it should work. If I vary the route through that path, it shouldn't make a difference because it's equivalent. If I vary the input and it's all valid, it shouldn't make a difference which one we put in. And that makes the oracles easy. Because with uh, model-based testing, the thing that's hard is usually the oracles, knowing whether there's a problem. But when it's all valid data, the oracles are simple because we should be able to go to the next page. We should be able to submit the form. If any of those things don't happen, we found a problem. So this is a sample application that I've got on Heroku so you can see it. And it simulates what we had in the real world example. This only has five fields. Um, and there's some automation code in GitHub that I spent about an hour working on so you can see what we can automate in an hour. And running this to cover exhaustively the data that we're using takes about 10 minutes. Whereas in the real example, it would take days to exhaustively go through. And when I run my simple test, what it does is it randomly generates data within an equivalence class. It randomly chooses which of the fields to fill in so it can do them in different order. It randomly chooses something from the drop down because everything in the drop down should work. And it randomly chooses how it's going to submit the form, whether it clicks on the button, whether it hits return, whether it submits the form. So I get a lot of coverage. And it's all equivalent. It should all always work. And I report at the end. And it does find the two main issues that I know I put in. So it finds a validation issue, a backend validation issue, where one of the drop down values is not represented on the back end. That can take a long time to find when you have 200 items in a drop down. It finds a front end validation, where again, something in the drop down is not valid from the front end validation. But again, that can take a long time to find. Um, when we're doing this kind of work manually. But the time spent automating it is far less than the time it would take to find this manually. And the code's really simple. I'm going to give you a quick code walkthrough. It's basically a loop. Um, <clears throat> it has the steps that we do, which is visit the form, fill in the form correctly, submit the form, check whether it's valid. And then it's a whole bunch of randomization through that. So when it fills in the form correctly, it randomly chooses the order of fields. Then it randomly picks values for those and puts them in. The random data generation is all custom, which could be a risk, but it's fairly easy to wrap with unit tests, right? Because when we write our automation code, we do want to unit test parts that are um, reusable, that are not interacting with the outside world, use the same processes that we use on normal production code, test-driven development unit testing to build our um, support code. Then when I'm choosing something from the country list, um, I have to maintain a list of what things I have picked because I want to do this exhaustively and choose all of them. I just want to choose all of them in a random order. And then if I do more testing, I just want to loop around. So there's a bunch of things I have to, to write, but it's not hard because anytime you're working with equivalence partitions, it doesn't matter what order you do, it doesn't matter what value it is, we can randomize this and that will increase our coverage. Now, a lot of people don't like random data, which is fine, but if we do randomize, we just have to keep um, a log of what we're doing to allow us to repeat it. I'm quite happy with random data within equivalence partitioning because if it finds a problem, Hopefully it's finding a problem because we will have ruled out all our synchronization issues. Oracles are very easy when it's equivalence partition. So we've got even 
less chance of making um, flaky execution. And it's more likely that this will find a problem that will be hard to find through coverage. Um, if you're going to do this strategically long term, you might want to seed the data, but we don't have to go that far um, when we're doing this tactically. And all the code for this is on GitHub, so you can have a look at it and repeat it against the application that's live. Just to get an idea of what can we do in an hour, or what can some, and the code's deliberately written badly in terms of it was written in an hour, but it works and it's fairly robust. And the aim for this is to think differently about automating, right? And our, our main project was, our strategy was agile, so we were doing a lot of automating, but that didn't apply to this new part of the project because it was tactical. But it did because we needed to do it where it's taking too much manual time. But if we have the skill set and we think about what we could achieve with automating, we can target specific parts of it very quickly and very easily. We don't have to wait till the application is stable. We could, under certain circumstances, automate first. And then if the automating says it's stable, then we test it. And we're doing that easily because it's all equivalence partitions. And this was essentially a risk of my time, a couple of hours, but having spent those couple of hours, we saw that it's working, then we spend more time, but it was still tactical. So we didn't spend too much time over engineering it. You have to balance how much time you're spending with the risks that you're mitigating. And this is augmenting our test approach. It wasn't designed to replace the testing we were doing. It was designed to put something in place to make sure that the testing that we were doing was adding more value and not just finding obvious problems. And sometimes we just add tooling. So when I'm doing a lot of exploratory testing, I can't observe everything. I'm very focused on one thing, building a model of how the application works. I can't watch the GUI and the network traffic and the backend and the server and the memory usage and the database and all the other stuff at the same time. But tools can help me observe as I'm testing. So I can have the network traffic up, but I still have to split my attention between the network traffic and the thing that I'm testing. So what if I had um, tools that could help me look at the content of the messages to observe the content, which I normally have to interrogate later on? Could I create something that observed the messages as I was testing and tell me as I'm testing if there's any problems? So I was doing some security testing and one of the issues we found was data leakage. So I wanted to traverse the site um, in an exploratory fashion and observe in the background whether there were any data leaks. Um, and I wanted this as an observation so that it would alert me as I was working so that I know at what point we found the issue. Now I could potentially do this by uh, testing through a proxy and having some scripting in the proxy that alerts me when it's found something, or I could do it interrogating afterwards to scan the HAR file that the proxy's created. But in this case, I wrote a little tool that uses the Chrome, uh, Chrome debug protocol to start up the browser and observe the traffic. It's a very simple tool. I've released it on GitHub so you can see it. And it basically just scans for certain fields or values. So this is it running. Here's me using my website. I've told it to look for my email address and for my web address. And it's just telling me I found the, uh, the domain, I found the Twitter handle, I found the um, email address. So that as I'm testing, I can see if there's a problem. Now this wasn't a hard tool. There was other ways I could do it. But because it was a very specific need, I felt um, that creating a custom tool would be better. Excuse me a sec. And the, you can find all the code for this online. Now, we have to be careful that we don't let the technical excitement of creating a new tool take away from the testing that we want to do. <clears throat> so always bear that in mind when you're creating your own tools. So I prefer to use um, off-the-shelf tools, which is why I prefer to use tools that I can script. <clears throat> In fact, this slide deck, <clears throat> it is very hot here and I'm getting dry. 
this slide deck is automatically generated. I use a mind map um, and I write all my slides in the mind map. Then I have a script that generates it. Then I take the um, text that's generated and put it into an app called deck set, which automatically creates the slides. I don't spend a lot of time on formatting themes, slide decks, everything as much as possible, I automate. And very often when we're thinking, well, I need to automate something. So we think strategic. So we think I need to use specialist tools. I need to use specific libraries. I need specific environments. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes through our head. But if we just keep in mind, well, what are the capabilities of the stuff that I already have? What are the capabilities of the browser? <clears throat> now the browser has a JavaScript console. So maybe I could write some code in the JavaScript console to create data to help me test. So rather than doing it all manually, I could run a six line script and it will go away and create data for me, which would then allow me to do a lot of manual testing on top of and save my time. Now, if you want to learn how to do this, I've got a free course on Test Automation U that shows this. <clears throat> and learning how to do this opens up a lot of new options because I now automate in the browser a lot. Um, this has helped me with my web driver skills because I can now use JavaScript Executor to um, bypass a lot of uh, functionality to help me do things faster, to engage with the application in different ways. And again, this is very simple code. <clears throat> There's not a lot of uh, <clears throat> knowledge required in order to do this. And we can use this to help us automate the unautomatable, right? Because every time we learn something new, it opens up new options for us. Because some applications are very hard to automate externally. If they're canvas based and they have no HTML elements, it's hard to use browser based tools to automate them. We might think traditionally and uh, think, well, I'm going to have to find a visual tool. I'm going to have to find a tool that uses AI. So I'm going to show you an example application, which is a game from phobosslab.org and it's called X-Type. And it's a bullet hell shooter. So you move your little man around, there's bullets everywhere. It can be hard to play. I mean, it's hard enough for a human to do this. I mean, it's hard to automate this. It's hard to have the reaction time required um, if you're going to automate this externally. So this is one of those unautomatable applications, except what you're seeing on screen at this point in time is uh, an automated playthrough of the game. So I've automated this game from the JavaScript console, not using any AI. It's very simple. There's no complicated rules in there. There's a little bit more code than the simple example, but it's just practice building this up. Now, the reason for doing this is that some applications are very hard for humans to use long term and automating it to go to certain points can help. Automating cheats to help us get there can help. So I haven't put the code in here, but I'm just scanning through it. You can see it's basically just going, um, where is the position of bullets? Should I move left or right? And there's a lot of randomization in there to move things about. Now, in order to do this, we have to learn how to reverse engineer the application and look at it in more detail. We can do this with different frameworks. So there's a, a, an extra level of skill and experience required when we do it. But I'm showing you this so that you know that it's possible, so that you have an awareness of more options that are open to you when you approach applications. Because the aim is we should be thinking differently about automating in terms of thinking constantly about what else could I be doing? What capabilities of the tools am I not using? Are we picking tools that allow us, that open up options for us, that we can script and also keep thinking, well, what could I be doing? Have that 
constant imagination in place of, well, wouldn't it be great if we could? I can't do this, but it'd be great if we could suddenly get open in that area to keep expanding our possibilities for automating and not just keep doing the same. Here's a test. Here's a test. Here's a test. Think differently about how we can automate. So one of the things that I look for when I'm looking at automation code is, do we have abstractions that we can reuse? Or are they locked into a framework? Now, I have nothing against Gherkin tools <clears throat> like Cucumber, um, but the issue that I see is that people lock themselves into it. So they then have to do everything with Gherkin, which means if you want to do something ad hoc or support some exploratory testing, it can be hard to do because you haven't got the Gherkin framework to do that. What we want are abstraction layers that support us doing different things. And as an example of that, um, I used some abstraction layers that I created to create some small concurrent autonomous bots to help me use multi-user testing. So I had a multi-user app. I had a lot of single user tests. They all used abstraction layers. I wanted to know if the application could handle multiple users, but I didn't want to uh, write a completely new set of tests in a stress or performance tool. Now, I might have thought, can I use my tests and repurpose them as performance tests? Because sometimes people do that. But because I had abstraction layers, I was able to not use the test abstraction, but use the functional abstractions that the tests are using to create multi-threaded bots. And so to help with that, when I'm creating abstraction layers, I try to create a dependency um, of their own to try to try and keep them clean to avoid too much overlap between the tests and the abstraction layers to allow me to use the abstraction layers completely separately in an ad hoc fashion now this is a very strategic approach we have to commit to making the code clean and separate but as soon as we do that it opens up a lot more tactical use cases. We can use it in more ways. We can use it in ways we didn't intend to when we first wrote it. We're not locking ourselves down. We're giving ourselves the opportunity that when we imaginatively think of something, we can reuse our abstraction layers to do that. So by bot, I just mean something that's running as a thread. All the JavaScript bots have to kind of run in their separate threads because JavaScript is single threaded. And if it worked in a for loop, the application wouldn't continue. So we have to have learn how to use things as threads. But again, what you'll see is that the top level code is very simple. It's just a loop. And it says, what will I do next? I'll randomly pick one of my strategies. Now I'll do that. Now I'll randomly wait for a little while then I'll randomly do something else. And all these something else are equivalent with each other, or the bot is implementing a state machine to choose which is the valid thing to do next. And you'll see when you start working through this, that you'll use um, a couple of different patterns. So you'll use kind of strategy patterns or command patterns. Um, but everything that we're using to execute is using existing abstractions that we're already using to support normal testing. So I have a bunch of tests that do this thing, 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 but they're all using abstraction layers and I'm just repurposing the abstraction layers in a different way. <clears throat> so you eventually learn the command pattern or the strategy pattern or the screenplay pattern is an example of this because it has users or agents and things that the agent can do. And it's just a higher level that lets you chain things together in a slightly different way than having to do everything in a very linear fashion. And it's a very simple reuse example, but I'm reusing the abstractions because again, in terms of models, 
the tests themselves are models. They are models of a path through the application. But they're often not abstracted enough to make them reusable because the tests have a lot of preconditions. They have a lot of setup. They have a lot of tidy up. They change a lot of things. They depend on specific data. They don't play well with each other. But when we do bots, we want them to play well with each other. But the abstraction layers, if they can support um, threading and can support us reusing them, then we open up more examples, which is why I prefer to create abstractions that are libraries rather than frameworks. You'll hardly ever hear me talk about a framework, but I talk about libraries and abstraction layers a lot. So pretty much everything that I've talked about here is some form of model-based testing. And we do model-based testing even when we're not aware of it. Because the normal at test methods that we do are a model. They are a model of a path through the system. We are doing model-based testing without being aware of it. We're doing model-based testing that very often doesn't lend itself to more flexibility, but it's still model-based testing. All the abstractions that we put in place are models of the application from different viewpoints. Some of them are user focused models. Some of them are very physical focused models. What we want is to be able to reuse them in different ways. Um, and if we can use them in different ways, then we can start randomizing over equivalence partitions. We don't have to learn a lot of patterns to do this. If you look at the strategy and command pattern, that's pretty much all you ever need in order to do model based testing. So when we look at traditional automation, we hear a lot of rules. Don't automate unstable applications. Don't just knock up code because test code is production code. But what that really means is when we code, we should use the same approaches as production code. So we want to unit test the things that can be unit tested, TDD the things that are going to be risky that might cause flakiness in the future. Test automation doesn't have to take a long time. If we keep practicing, we build up our skill sets, we can knock up a lot very quickly that can be robust. We very often get told that tests should be short because long running automation is flaky. It doesn't have to be. We can have long running automation it randomly iterating over paths um, that can run for days. It just has to be stable, it has to synchronize well. Yeah, we have to know that the automation itself is not introducing problems. We can automate test uh, systems that we haven't fully tested yet. Test automation can find bugs. I write automation specifically targeted at specific bugs to test a whole bunch of data because I don't want to spend the time doing that myself. I want to harness the automation to look for the problems that I think are there. We don't always have to automate for the long term. We can automate tactically for the short term. And very often we talk about ROI and whether automation is worth the cost. <clears throat> Most of the time we don't have budgets. Most of the time what we have is time and we choose where to spend that time. That's the ROI, it's, is my time being spent in a way that is helping me move forward because everything that we're doing is to help our testing. So when you get told rules, treat them as heuristics, treat them as guidelines, because we have to know when these things apply and when they don't, because we are responsible. We take responsibility for this. We decide what we're doing. We're not breaking rules. What we're doing is making contextual decisions about the appropriate ways to automate for our needs, given what we can imagine, given the skill sets that we have, given the tooling and time that is available. It's not the rules that guide us, it's our skill sets, our knowledge, our ideas, and the time that we have. So always bear in mind different models of automating. Why do we automate? We automate to save time, money, to increase coverage, to allow us to do something else. Bear those things in mind and that can help focus your mind so that you don't just do at test, at test, at test. You create whatever you need in order to support your testing. Because ultimately, 
automation isn't driven by rules. It's driven by our ideas of what we want to cover. It's our ideas of what we could be doing. And then it gets supported by tooling. What we don't want is for tools to dictate. What we don't want is the standard structures that we use for testing to dictate what we automate and how we automate. So when I talk about thinking differently about automating, what I'm really talking about is thinking about automating, having as many models and abstraction layers as we can, and keeping in mind that we're automating to help us test better. So hopefully we have time for questions. So you can find me online. And now it's trying to work out Zoom. How do we get this? Um, stop share. So I stop share. Is that how it works? Yep. Dun, dun, dun. We have stopped share. <laughs> All right. So Great. Great. How thanks. Thanks, Alan. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think it was, I think it was interesting and insightful about how you're sort of going back and asking us to question uh, all the, the predefined or long held rules and ideas around automation. So I think that was, that was very interesting to think about it from a very different perspective. We have a few questions and folks, please keep them coming. We've got, uh, you know, about 10, 10 minutes uh, for questions. Um, Okay, so uh, okay, one question is around uh, how do you determine like how much um, effort uh, a specific tool or feature would require? So I'm guessing this person is asking about uh, one is the automation tool itself, and the second would be like uh, how much time or effort would it take to do test automation for a particular feature, especially when the feature is constantly changing. Um, yeah, so it's hard, right? Because uh, for some people, a tool requires a lot of effort, but for other people, a tool requires no effort because they've got the experience and the skill set because they're working on teams that share the skills, right? The, the ultimate aim for teams is to build a team that has multiple skill sets where everyone is collaborating. So if we want to automate well, we harness and um, the imagination of the testers, we harness the needs of the testers and we harness the coding skills of the people who are best on the team and we collaborate and work together the main issue we have is when we split it up and make it an, one single individual's responsibility that person hits something they don't know how to do they have to spend the time uh, <clears throat> learning about it rather than collaborating with someone else uh, i mean i've worked with a lot of really good programmers who have allowed me to ask a lot of stupid questions, which has allowed me to become a better programmer. Go. But the easiest way to determine how long it's going to take is to experiment and try something very small first, create an MVP. Sure. Sure. I think maybe a follow-up question related to that. I think a couple of people also asked about like what I know you talked a little bit in your uh, presentation about not thinking too much about tools or frameworks. Um, how, you know, if I'm starting down the path of automation, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, I, I need to decide on what framework and what, you know, what are the different tool sets that I'm going to use, right? Uh, sometimes there is a lot of, uh, you know, inertia with that decision because, you know, you're like taking a decision maybe for, for the long ter longer term, longish term. Uh, how do you sort of advise people to sort of think about that decision making process? <laughs> So don't make the decision for the long term early, right? Make short term decisions early around what value you can achieve. Then you learn from that and you see whether the tool works in your environment. You see whether it's flexible. You see whether you need more skill sets in order to take advantage of that tool. You see whether um, you have the support structure to help you use it. Um, and then if you realize that you do have all those things, then you commit to it. Um, but people try to get too strategic far too quickly. Mm, got it. Okay. Uh, next set of questions is around if my automation is not finding bugs uh, and mm. uh, you know, uh, we're not really able to identify the, the automation is running fine. Uh, everything seems to be working, but 
haven't really found any bugs is, is that how do I, uh, you know, handle that as a signal? Uh, you know? Well, so some automated execution is not designed to find bugs, right? It's designed to um, <clears throat> reinforce the belief that certain conditions are continued to be met, right? Because what we did is we came up with acceptance criteria. We tested the acceptance criteria. We resolved a lot of bugs. We automated it. And that's just a safety net to make sure that that acceptance criteria never stops being valid. What we might choose to do is to increase the um, ability for that automated execution to find bugs and possibly mm. introduce more randomness or more property-based execution around the confines that that criteria has. Because it's unlikely that the whole condition is going to break, but there might be some set of data within there that could. So we could change the automation to increase the possibilities that it will find bugs. But then a lot of automation doesn't find bugs because it wasn't designed to find bugs. Got it. it was designed to check for change, not to expand and investigate coverage. Got it. So speaking about randomness, you sort of talked about uh, randomizing <laughs> data. Um, I think uh, the question is around, is it okay to have random paths slash data as part of your tests? Um, I haven't, I'm just going to read the question out. I have an understanding that tests need to be tested against a given set of data in order to assert the outcome, right? Will that <clears throat> randomness yep. also be handled in the patterns? So that comes down to, well, what is that test testing? Is the test condition the path or is the test condition the end result of following a path? Are there multiple ways of getting to the same condition? If there are, then maybe we can randomize how we get there. But you don't, and you could um, just have random exploration of the system, right? But then you have the Oracle problem of how do I know if this thing has found a problem? Because we didn't guide it in the right way. And so if you have a look at the example that I put on in the code for that first one, it does randomize the path, but it doesn't randomize the whole path. So it randomizes, um, so it doesn't come in and say, fill in the name, fill in the age, pick something from the country. It says, fill in the name, fill in the age, fill in the country, fill in the country, fill in the age, fill in the, the name. It randomizes that. So it randomizes a subset of the path, the equivalent parts of the path. Because some paths have constraints, right? Uh, a certain set of data needs to be in place for this path to work. And that's what the end condition depends on. So we don't randomize that. But if there's anything else that you can randomize that makes no ultimate difference, if it's one of an equivalence class, then you can randomize it relatively easily. Got it. Got it. Uh, another question, I think in one of your slides, you talked about TDD, the flaky stuff. Uh, how do you identify the flaky stuff? So the stuff that you think is risky. So when I'm writing random generation code from scratch, I know that that's risky because I, I get um, indexes off by one a lot. And it may not only it may not appear until I've done a thousand iterations. So I will unit test that. And um, anything that is kind of a support to what I'm doing, I will unit test that. So I have a lot of classes that represent users, test data. Um, it, that's the stuff that I will unit test. What I won't unit test are my page objects because that's interacting with the physical world. But anything else is fair game for me to unit test. Go on. Okay. All right. A fairly longish question around re reducing duplication. I think if you have like a test across multiple pages, uh, where it's like a, you know, let's say a five page journey, uh, you know, and I've written basically the user has written tests for each of these pages, uh, and they have to go through this in sequence. I think the question is around how do I reduce duplication mm -hmm. and still be able to sort of follow that path. So when it's a long thing, Right, there's a temptation to um, chain tests and say, well, this test gets to this point, this next test does this, next test. Don't do that. Right. Instead, what you do is you abstract up. So if very often my tests will 
be quite long, but they'll say things like, um, the user comes in, logs in, creates a thing, does this other thing, then I drop down to a much lower level of abstraction on the page to do things. You want a concise abstraction layer that can do a lot of things, and that's what you reuse. So it's, it's ultimately abstraction. You abstract that long path into a shorter subset that you can reuse in a different place. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, okay. Another question around, I think you talked about like mm. uh, some of the rules about, uh, you know, don't have long tests, you know, uh, or don't have, yeah, keep try to stick to short tests. So it's a question around how do you determine, you know, what is a short test and what is, long? is there some standard or some benchmark that we can shoot towards? So I think what we really want is to test the conditions we're interested in as quickly as possible, right? And so some conditions are buried away in the application. We don't necessarily want to have a long test that goes all the way through the application to get there. So perhaps we can um, log in at one point, share a cookie across some sort of static variable, jump directly to a URL and then do a little test in there. We don't necessarily need to have long tests. And the point of the long tests is sometimes having long running tests that do a lot of things can be quite useful. And um, in general, I will try and make my specific test very short because much of the testing that we're doing is aimed at checking whether a particular condition still works and we want the feedback on that fast. When I am trying to find bugs, sometimes I will zip in really quickly and explore a particular condition with a lot of data. But sometimes I will want to traverse through the system um, and cover the paths because sometimes there's emergent behavior that we won't know about unless we actually follow through those paths. Hmm. So um, it really, if it's a strategic test and it's part of the continuous integration, it will probably be small. If it's not part of the continuous integration process designed to detect change, then pretty much the rules are out the window and it's about what information are we trying to get back and what skill sets do we have to make that effective. Got it. Got it. All right. I think there's one last, we have time for maybe one last question. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, Maybe two, two questions. All right. So one is, uh, do you recommend or, or, or do you have any recommendations in terms of tools or libraries uh, that will provide the biggest return on investment mm. in terms of uh, starting to learn, going down a learning path? Um, so it depends on whether it's return on investment to your career or return on investment to your project. Because um, some tools are free, um, some tools are new. Um, I, honestly, it really depends what you're automating. The tools I tend to use. So I tend to use WebDriver. Um, I tend to use Java as my programming language. When I'm working with APIs, I'll tend to use REST Assured or HTTP client abstractions. Um, when I'm doing exploratory testing, I use a lot of different tools, a lot of different proxy tools. Um, it really um, massively varies. But I think the aim is don't use every tool under the sun try and stick with a tool and maximize the value out of it as possible until you reach its limits, at which point you start looking for other things. Got it. Okay, I think this is a question that I have seen uh, sort of a, a recurring theme. Uh, how, do, how does one go about reducing flakiness of, of your tests, right? If, uh, you know, so people are, what are some of the, practices that you recommend in terms of uh, removing the flakiness of your test suite? Um, so you kind of have to make sure you know why the flakiness isn't there, but most of the flakiness that I see in production is related to poor synchronization, mm. right? Not waiting for the application to be in the right state before we interact with it. Um, so typically if you're using um, implicit weights, that's a massive source of synchronization that is very hard to remove. So use as many explicit weights as possible. Um, do weight on not just application state, but also the um, JavaScript framework that you're working with. 
if you can synchronize on the JavaScript framework, it can reduce a massive amount of um, flakiness very quickly. But it really depends where it is. So if you do encounter flakiness, try and resolve it as fast as possible. Otherwise, you just compound lots and lots of noise to make it hard to investigate. Got it. Great, great. Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, thanks a lot. I think, uh, again, uh, some eye-opening thoughts on, on you know, breaking the rules when it comes to thinking about test automation. So I think uh, it, was, it was very in insightful and helped a lot of people think about approaching test automation from a completely different perspective. So thank you. Thank you again for your time and uh, for you know, for some of some of your answers, I think there are lots of fans uh, in the chat. The chat's exploding with uh, a lot of Alan Alan Richardson fans. So uh, okay, I'll have a look at the chat. Yeah, um, yeah thanks please. for having me. Thanks a lot. And um, hope the rest of the day goes well. Thank you very great. much. Thank you, Alan. Have a great day.